Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for allowing us to come together and study this morning. We thank you for the light that you've been opening up um, to encourage us, to direct us. As we begin this study, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you'd watch over the production we're doing here and make it beneficial, something that would edify your people and glorify yourself. Please pour your latter rain out upon us at this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into our notes, I'm sorry for being late. Um, I wished I could blame it on Odilio, but I really can't. He, he e emailed me with enough time that I can't use him as an excuse for getting here late. But he emailed me a screenshot of this, so I want to go back to this just briefly. Um, and I want to make the case that one of the things that happen, that's happening here, irregardless of what the implications of this prophetic truth is, is that if we're willing to see it, you can see that the line of the tribe of Judah is opening up truth. He's, he's pouring his latter rain out upon us at this time. So, if just to re familiarize ourselves, what I was suggesting yesterday is that based upon Daniel 12.12 12, um, that the 1335 ends at the end of 1843 and the word cometh in verse 12 means toucheth. And what touches 1843 is either 1842 on this side or 1844. 1844 touches 1843. 33. So, blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to this point in time. And of course, this is the first disappointment for the Millerites. This is the end of 1843. And therefore, this ending of 1843 has to take place in order to identify when the Lord removes his hand. Because what he removes his hand for, from for the Millerites is the fullness of the year mistake. Now, Samuel Snow and others were already figuring out that it wasn't 1843 before you get to this point, but that doesn't change the structure of the message that is there for us to consider. So you have your first disappointment right here, um, and you have associated with that 1335, which we identified those numbers multiplied together equal for. Um, 45, and so we were tying it in with the 1533, which also equals 45. Um, and there's a blessing for the Millerites when they come to this, and what I was saying is that the Lord repeated that history by removing his hand from the understanding of Raphia and Paneum, and I'm saying this is the key that is opening up Daniel's last vision the same way that the fullness of the year mistake was the key for the Millerites to identify October 22nd, 1844. The key that opens up their ability to identify when the door closes was the fullness of the year. The key that identifies, when, that gives us the, the point of reference where we can identify when the door closes was Rafi and Paneum. And that was opened up on December 17th, 2016. So what Odilia noticed and sent in to this morning was if you put 12 for December plus 17 for the 17th and 16 for 2016, what do you suppose it equals? 45. Okay, so <laughs> there, there's another numerical observation in this. 12 is December, 17th is the day, the 16th is the year. Okay, month, day, year. Added together equals 45. December 17th, 2016. The Lord removes his hand from Raphi and Paneum. Blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to this point in time, who touches this. And so from that, I went back to something from last week. My point is, is that if you're willing to see it, not only are we opening up the light of the 
four kingdoms in Daniel 11. Uh, not only is the Lord opening them up, but not only we're sharing them at this point, but he's continuing to open up these chronological, chronological observations. Um, Question? Yes. Can you um, give the dates one more time for the three touches of Daniel? Can I? What's I got to do? Okay. The dates for the three touches of Daniel. Uh, tell me, Clayton, if I'm, if I'm getting in the wrong spot. No, you're fine. Okay. The three touches of Daniel may, may very well have more than one application because symbols do have more than one application at some time. September 7th, first touch. 63 days later, November 9th, second touch. 63 days later, January 11th, third touch. Thank uh, you. And what we did with that, because you brought it up, is if you take 97 from this, just treat it as a number, 119 and 111, it equals 327. 327 being March 27th, okay? But if you're going to approach this same thing backwards, as the Europeans do, okay? Then it isn't 97, it's 79. It's not 119, it's 911. And it's the same here. And this equals, and I'd have to look at my notes to be sure, unless someone knows. Okay, we'll just add it up. 79, 111 equals 1, 0, 11, okay. It equals 1101. Okay. So 1101, we're treating this as European, remember? 11. This is US, this is European dating. At the US level, it's March 27th, but at the European level, it's 111, which is January 11th. January 11th, January 11th. Okay, everyone got that? So, I don't know anything about the rules of uh, mathematical possibility, you know, you can, but there are rules you can calculate out the probability of something happening. The probability of this happening has to be, uh, yeah, it, it's beyond, okay, so, beyond calculation possibly. What I want, what I want us to see, only, only because, I'm going to blame this on Abdelio because he's getting, I'm getting behind in my time to get through these notes that I'm not getting to. When he observed this this morning, he sent this in. That, that's pretty profound stuff as well. What? What I started with. The day. Okay. That 12, 17, 2016 adds up to 45 as well. And that date is the opening up of uh, Raphael and Peniponium, correct? No, this date here, mm -hmm. what we're no, saying here, no, December when you just point yeah, out yes, December 17th is when Raphael and Peniponium was opened up, right. um, which is blessed is he who cometh to. This is when the Lord removes his hand. Um, this here, this is the midnight chiasm, is what I'm calling it, because this is Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. This is where Ezekiel, all the prophets, he's John, Ezekiel, um, Daniel, where the sanctuary is opened up, and they see the wheels within wheels. But, it, but Sister White tells us, at first view, it seems confusing. But, he, but after a little bit of time, then it, there's perfect order to it. So I'm saying that here is where he opened this up, and here on January 11th is where Gideon goes down into the enemy's camp, and here's the dream and the interpretation thereof, and all this, all these wheels within wheels come into view, and my testimony was, is where it clicked on for me was January 11th, and it did so in this room, which was a Sabbath, these are all Sabbaths, 
And it did so when Daniel was preaching that day. He was given the sermon. And I'm only bringing that up because he was the one that, was, that opened, at least turned the lights on. And his name is Daniel. Okay, And this is where Gideon goes down. Here's the dream and interpretation thereof. You can find that in the story of Gideon, and you can only find the expression dream and interpretation thereof in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 4. So I, I even think the Lord was overruling that it was Daniel that was preaching that day. But let me put one more thing in place and then try to get back to our notes. January 14th, 2017. No, 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 no. Um, I'm looking for all right maybe I, I, I wanted to cut and paste some commentary by um, by um, Theodore and I don't think I cut it all, so I'm not going to have the information. What Theodore last week brought into this was the chiasm of March 27th, 327, 327, and 327. This is 20, and 2019. Okay, um, here, what we've noted is this Sabbath, the Adventist Church has proclaimed 100 days of prayer uh, because of the pandemic, which takes you to July 4th of this year, 2020. And we're understanding this chiasm as the chiasm of the Levites, I guess. This is, this is the message of calling the Levites out. Um, and what Theodore um, pointed out was right here is where I'm going into retirement. Okay. Um, it, in this classroom, I did the last presentation on March 26th, if I recall right. I, I didn't didn't get that one paragraph, and he has this all documented. The next day, the last School of the Prophets presentation you did prior to September 2019 was 1863. You then presented from March 31st to April 9th, April 8th, April 9th, um, in in the Prophecy School. Okay, so I end right here. I'm done. I, I, the last thing I do is shut door, a presentation in the shut door, and then 1863. And then we have a prophecy school here, over there in the pavilion. Um, and it ends on April 9th. And April 9th is March 27th in the Julian. Um, okay. And um, September's. But. This March, this is the one I want to get. This, from March 31st to April 8th and 9th, April 9th, Gregorian is March 27th. You were in retirement from April 9th, Gregorian, March 27th, Julian, to September 7th, Gregorian. That March is exactly halfway between October 13th and September 7th, 2019. All right, I can't do it. I had to, I, I thought I had it, but I let the paragraph that focused this in for me, I, I didn't cut and paste. So anyway, last week, I'll leave it real simple that we'll all remember. The Lord was opening, he was confirming. Theodore's already been dealing with March 27th, but once the Adventist church proclaims this 100 days of prayer, then it comes into clarity that, that this is also a chiastic structure. If you remember, this chiastic structure consists of how many days? Everyone remember? It's, it's from 2019 to 2021, it's 731 days. And what's 731? 
it's 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 July 31st but in the Julian it is July 18th okay so 731 days is a number that's speaking that's identifying the message that is to be given to the Levites this is about this is a, a chiastic structure about the Levites um, what I wanted to show and I and I didn't have the material I'm going to tell you what it is okay when I finish here I, at the prophecy school that followed the shutting down of this school and at that prophecy school is where I announced my retirement but here is the last time I taught in the school at this prophecy school on April that ends on April 8th and 9th um, from that point to September 7th uh, this is what I wanted to do is tie this in from this point April 9th, the end of this prophecy school, which is March 27th in the Julian. So, okay, so 4 9 Gregorian, that's a 4, but is 3 27 in the Julian. To here, this is the five months of hiding, okay, and this five months of hiding is significant in a number of ways because when they're having this meeting in Germany, they're having it in the very place where Luther went into hiding. And Luther stays in hiding for how long? For five months. Why does Luther come out of hiding? Because of fanaticism in the heart of the work. Okay, so, so they have a history there. They had a history there in Germany that would have helped them see uh, before they went off in darkness what was going on. And, but I calculated, here's my point, I calculated this five months that I was in retirement, so to speak. How many days do you suppose it is? Five months is 150 days prophetically, and it's not 150. It's 151. 151. Okay, that, that's the information I wanted to put together that I had a paragraph I didn't cut and paste. It. So what I'm saying here, we've looked at this last week. I've added a little bit of this, th different than last week. March... March 27th, um, this chiasm of March 27th has to do with taking the message to the Levites, uh, I believe. Um, there's a, a breaking off here um, between the two movements, the new movement and the old movement. There's a door closed. Um, Question? Yes. On that 151, it says 327 Julian. What's the date above it and what's the significance? This, okay, the significance of this is when our, our prophecy school ended here. April 8th okay. slash 9th, okay, and April 9th, this is 4-9. April. Okay, April 9 to September 7th, 151 days. But April 9 in the Julian is March 27th. Okay? Yes? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, here's, here's what I was looking for. The first time I presented Raphia and Paneum was in Canada. And, and we, oh, we, oh, I remember it. I've checked it out. Um, and it was January... 14th, 2017. 1-14, 2017. Okay. So, Rafi and Paneum is what we need to touch if we're going to be blessed. Okay, it's the 1335, it's the 1533. You follow me? And if you go 1533 days from the first time that Rafi and Paneum was presented, where do you suppose you come to? You come to March 27th, 2021. is 1,533 days. So when we're talking about this 1,533 and this 1,335 for the Millerites being a blessing and 1,533 being a blessing for us, and we're seeing the Lord opening up the chiasm 
for Adventism for the Levites um, with March 27th. And we can see that the subject of Rafi and Paneum was first presented in Canada on the 14th of January 2017. And then it's 1,533 days that takes you to March 27th, 2021, the end of this chiasm. They're all getting tied together. The difficulty is to be able to lie them, lay them out in a visual where you can see them tied together. Okay. What? Or to believe that there's free will. <laughs> okay. So, um... Is it 2018? January 14, 2018? 17. It was... 17. Oh, okay, so 16. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So 16 what? December 17, 16 is the first... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it was opened up, Rafi and Paniam, here on 12 17, 2016. But put Canada above the 14th. Okay, thank you. And, and the first time it was preached in terms of Rafi and Paniam, we were, we were understanding a little bit about Rafi and Paniam. My point here is, I'm probably saying it wrong. What I came to understand right before I went to Canada, I had notes prepared for Canada, and a couple days or a day before I left, things opened up about Paneum. Okay, it was a Paneum. Paneum is what was really opened up here. This is where we went up there and we laid out the various names of Paneum, pandemic, panic. Uh, that's what opened up. At, at this point. So, and I'm saying that that is the punchline. If you're going to if you're going to take Raphia and Paneum, Paneum seems like the one that is the, the punchline of both of them. And remember, uh, you may not remember, but in this camp meeting, before I knew that, that there was apostasy among us, I was addressing in that camp meeting that ended on April 9th, one of the themes that I addressed, I'm just popping into my head right now, is Tess was on the other side of the world someplace and she was, I didn't understand why she was, why I would present something at that camp meeting and then before the day was over I'm hearing about, uh, yeah, that half right, I was hearing from her why it was wrong. And one of the things was half right and half wrong. There was more than one thing. As I go back and look at what I was addressing, I was responding to to what she was saying publicly and one of their, their I was in a, ongoing email dialogue with one of their main guys from Wales and he was telling me why I was wrong and why I was going into darkness and why I'd struck the rock a second time and I was going to be lost and it's, it's that kind of stuff that was contributing to me saying hey I've had enough but I was making the case about um, right here that you can't separate these two subjects and I was making it in terms of an uh, argument that was going on at that time, in that history, in that camp meeting. And I had it in my head when I started this thought, and it's jumped. It had to do with the sanctuary and the host, I believe. Um, and you can't separate the sanctuary and the host any more than you can se separate Rafi and Paneum. And I was making an argument against that, that idea. Yes. Then where does, where does, where does Rafi fit in? between now and, and July 18th. That's the thing I can't seem to figure out. It seems like we got all the dates, but Rafia doesn't seem to fit in. Well, if there may, be, there may be several people that have been following these studies, but they've been so drawn out, I'll give you them the benefit of the doubt. If you haven't heard how I'm applying Rafi and Paneum, then you didn't listen. Okay, because I even have it some one place in my notes, I believe, where I'm saying that uh, for the papacy, Rafia is the Sunday law in the United States, and Paneum is the close of probation. There's four kingdoms in Daniel 11. I'm, I saw that, and I, I agree. I'm talking specifically about Russia. Okay, so where is Rafia for Russia? Yes. Okay, so... Um, but let me, back, let me do it my way first. Rafia f for us was November 9th. 
right here. And Paneum for us is July 18th for the priests. Okay, and I'm arguing that for the king of the south, um, their, their first battle that they win is July 18th. That's Rafia. And their, their battle where they lose is December 25th. That's Paneum for the king of the south. And for, who else is in there? For the United States, okay, for the United States. Rafia for the, for the United States, for Trump, was the impeachment articles in December of last year. And Paneum for Trump, which opens up this pandemic and panic and things that are going right now, is February 2nd, 2020. The acquittal. acquittal. You're saying that July 18th with regards to Russia, that's Rafia. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying they, the strike that comes there, initially they're on, they, are, they prevail. Um, but it don't last long. I'm also saying that that begins the Third World War. The, the caveat that I have to that, the part that I, that I also see there, and, and, and I intended to get to that in the notes, so I'll save that. I, there's a, more to say. That's where I'm going right now. I'm trying to, this presentation here that we haven't started, the notes, this introduction was just, this is Odilio's fault, okay? He made me return to just summarize some things that have been going on, all right? Uh, now we're going to get into our notes, and the notes, the purpose of the notes is to try to bring to conclusion our consideration of one of the four kingdoms in Daniel 11, that being the king of the south, okay? We've been dealing with subjects that speak to that history of... Quick comment? Yeah? On your 1533 of Canada, the Raffia Paneum to the 327-2021, you have 1533 there? Yep. The dead center of that chiastic structure is February 20th, 2019, which is the 220. I don't see any historical dates, but it does put 220 at the very center of that chiasm. Okay, if you turn this into a chiasm, you're saying that this is February 20th, 2020. Because it's 766.5 days, so you would pull half into that other day, I think. Okay, seven. All right, we don't know what that means, but there is here February 20th of this Sorry. year. Um, Two weeks after tr of Trump's of 2019. Okay, we don't know what that represents, but it does represent a 220. If you're open to look look at those things. Okay, so all right. Yesterday, um, I mentioned I, one thing. I'm just I'm just cleaning, doing a little house cleaning right now. Um, I mentioned that in the story of Shiloh that Jeremiah refuse, refers to in Jeremiah 7 and when Jeremiah refers to Shiloh in Jeremiah 7 it is the first of three places that Jeremiah says do not pray for these people okay when you get to that story it ultimately takes you to the next place where where Jeremiah is going to say, don't pray for this people. And that's in chapter 11. And in chapter 11 of Jeremiah, and I mean, it's, it's a pretty profound thing. It's the only place in the scriptures where you're going to see God telling a prophet, don't pray for these people any longer. Uh, but the, the middle point of those three expressions is found in chapter 11 of Jeremiah. The third is in chapter 14. But what's of interest to me is that in the middle one, in Jeremiah 11, verse 9, is where there, he says there's a conspiracy among this people. That's the conspiracy of 11.9, Jeremiah 11.9, of November 9th. It's the conspiracy of Parminder and Tess seeking to turn upside down the light of November 9 by introducing a counterfeit and, and resisting the truth of it. So... In Shiloh, um, in the story of Shiloh, which begins that, those three references in Jeremiah 7, 
uh, in the history of Shiloh, that's where the ark is taken captive. It's a classic illustration of the Sunday law. Um, that's where Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas are all, they all die there. And Phinehas's wife has a baby that's going to die. And she names it Ichabod, which means the glory is gone. So I referenced here a day, a day ago or so that that lines up with the Sunday law because that's where the glory, the Constitution of the United States, is removed. And then yesterday, Daniel reminded me of... I, I thought I put it up on the board. Oh, it's up here. Of F Four, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 34. And I have that in here because it adds to this story. It, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, uh, it, Ichabod is the story of Shiloh where the ark was being kept when Eli was the high priest. But now this is the destruction of Jerusalem which we have many witnesses illustrate the Sunday law. So it's a second witness to Ichabod marking the Sunday law and it says it's a page one of the today's notes. The top quote says Ichabod. Yeah, we have three of them today. Now, yeah, uh, one. The other two are yesterday's corrected. Yeah, the other two are, I've cleaned up, got them in order. So the one that says Ichabod, it says, The blind obstinacy of the Jewish leaders and the detestable crimes perpetuated within the besieged city excited the horror and indignation of the Romans, and Titus at last decided to take the temple by storm. And it tell, in this paragraph it tells about the destruction of the temple. This is AD 70. It says, Above the sound of the battle were heard voices shouting, Ichabod, the glory is departed. So what I'm saying, this is a second witness. To the, the ark being captured at Shiloh, the destruction of Jerusalem, Sunday law. Uh, but in those two witnesses, we have the expression Ichabod in the inspired record, the glory departed, and the glory of the United States is the Constitution. At the Sunday Law, the Constitution is fully overturned. But the Constitution is pretty much overturned at the midnight cry as well. In fact, in essence, the Constitution is gutted at 9-11, because at 9-11, this country has switched from English law to Roman law with the Patriot Act. Of course, the Patriot Act was written in 1996 when this activity was formalized. And so even 1996 is an attack against the Constitution and that follows on the heels of Ronald Reagan appointing an ambassador to the papacy. Okay, uh, So this whole history uh, the, of this movement, of this message, is an attack on the Constitution. So you see those echoes in each of the waymarks, uh, but ultimately it's Daniel 11 verse 41 that we're speaking about. Now, yesterday I told you about a, some, a, what do they call this when you, table? Uh, yeah, two columns. Um, the the left-hand column is the midnight cry, and the right-hand column is the Sunday law. All right, and this was just, I was just putting this in the record to remind us. We have dealt with virtually everything in here in the past, particularly when I've been dealing with the importance of the doubling, okay, that the history from the midnight cry to the Sunday law is repeated in the history of the Sunday law to the close of probation. So what I did here was line up the history of the midnight cry and the Sunday Law, because I wanted to plug in what we've been looking at, the French Revolution. So you'll see the two columns, Midnight Cry, across from it, the Loud Cry. Okay, Triumphal Entry, the Cross. Sister White says the Triumphal Entry illustrates the Midnight Cry in the Millerite history, and Jesus was going to the Cross, and the Cross is the Sunday Law. Everyone following the logic, okay? Caesarea Philippi, what is Caesarea Philippi? It's where Jesus opens up to the disciples specifically and directly, I'm going to Jerusalem to be crucified. Right? He had said it, but they never got it. But in Caesarea Philippi, that's where he says, okay, now I'm on my way to Jerusalem to be crucified. So Caesarea Philippi, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the cross. Caesarea Philippi is what? It's Paneum, correct? 
Okay, so it's, it's speaking to us. At the midnight cry, Jerusalem is chosen and Jerusalem is destroyed. And at the loud cry, Jerusalem is chosen and Jerusalem is destroyed. And if you don't, if you haven't settled into this reality, you need to. When, when Jesus is taking Jerusalem, choosing Jerusalem, choosing the 144,000 as his representatives on planet Earth, he is rejecting the Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay, the Seventh-day Adventist church was chosen to be Jerusalem in the Millerite history. And at the midnight cry, the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to come into agreement with apostate Protestantism and Catholicism and the laws of the land in, in signing on to this, this Sunday law that marks the beginning of a series of Sunday laws. And that point, they, they've signed their own death warrant. Um, now, it's going to happen more fully at the Sunday Law, verse 41, but they have destroyed themselves as Jerusalem at that point, and you will find prophecies that speak to that, but you will find other prophecies that speak to that, that at that very point in time, Jesus is choosing the new Jerusalem, not the heavenly new Jerusalem, the, the Jerusalem, the new covenant people. Okay, this is just, ha this is just a story that every time the Lord enters into covenant with a people, He's passing by the former covenant people. And the former covenant people and the new covenant people can be represented by Jerusalem. Okay, and at the midnight cry, there is an ensign lifted up for the Levites. At the Sunday law, there's an ensign lifted up for the Nethanims. August 11th, 1840 is the midnight cry. October 22nd, 1844 is the Sunday law. Everyone understand that? And therefore, from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, you have 1,533 days. Okay, because August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844 is 1,533 days. From Paneum on July 18th to December 25th is going to be a glorious manifestation of the power of God, which is 1,533. Okay. Midnight cry takes place in the history of verse 40. The loud cry is the history of verse 41. Now the next one, I put in this in place because we're going we're gonna to move into the story of the presidents of the United States and the presidents of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in the presidents of the United States... What chapter of Daniel are you referring to on the 40... Daniel 11. That's Daniel 11 verse 40 and Daniel 11 verse 41. The eighth is of the seven is a, you know it's important, I know it's important because I began to watch Parminder destroy what we had taught for years and years and years. I mean, the eighth is of the seven was an, a, a firmly established truth from Revelation 17 with lots of witnesses. We would go into the book of Daniel and we would show uh, two or three witnesses in the book of Daniel that Rome always comes up of eighth and is of the seven. So th this was a, a truth that was established firmly in Revelation 17. Rome, modern Rome, is the eighth and it's of the seven because it was the fifth kingdom. Now it's the eighth kingdom. And the eight is the symbol of resurrection and the fifth kingdom is the only kingdom that's identifying as having a deadly wound. It gets, there's so much weight on this eighth is of the seven but I can remember here on this property, uh, Tyler and Daniel from Brazil harassing me about why I was wrong about the eighth is of the seven and what Parminder was teaching was right. And my problem was is I could not, I could not follow Parminder's logic that they were pushing. They'd accept it at face value, even if it was illogical and it didn't fit. They were his champions on it. And I was trying to say, okay, explain it to me. I want, I want to understand it if it's wrong. And I, it never would click on. It wouldn't click on. I just, I just guess I don't have the mentality to easily accept Jesuit philosophy. Amen. Okay, so, so now I look back and I know that this eighth is of the seven was an important important enough that Satan wanted to attack it, okay? And so when you get to the presidents of the United States, which we're heading in the, the following studies, you ask an American who was the first president of the United States, and they're going to tell you George Washington, but he really wasn't. There were seven 
uh, presidents during the Constitutional Convention. Then there was 10 presidents during the, uh, the time period of the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation transcend into the Constitution in 1789 and George Washington becomes that president. He's actually what you would call the, the 18th or 19th president. And I say 18th or 19th because the first seven presidents that's followed by 10 presidents that first of the 10 presidents is also the seventh. So at that level, where the first seven presidents transcend into the second 10 presidents, the one that ties them together, he's the eighth because he's the first of the 10, but he's of the seven because he was the seventh. So when you see this history of the presidents, you see there at the beginning that there is an eighth that's of the seven, and what I'm telling you is that when we take the beginning of the United States, which is, among other things, the story of the presidents, and bring it down to the end of the United States, which we're speaking of Trump, so the story of the presidents have to, have to speak to the end of the world, that we find that in the story of the presidents, one of the prophetic manifestations is that the eighth is of the seven. Okay, so what I'm saying in advance of getting there is that the midnight cry, the eighth of the, uh, is of the seven, is internal. Okay, but at the Sunday law, the eighth is of the seven is external, but they're both there. Okay, because at the midnight cry, the Lord is choosing Jerusalem. Okay, and it's, it's internal there because this is where the separation between the covenant people is made clear visually. Okay, this is where the Jerusalem is getting lifted up as an ensign because they made a prediction about July 18th that came true. Okay, so at this point you've had how many churches in Revelation? Seven. Okay, and, and you can show that the Adventist church is, is Laodicea. Sister White says it over and over and over again. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But now, Laodicea, the, Laodicea, the Adventist church is fully being passed by at the midnight cry. And the Lord is entering into covenant with the 144,000. And who are the 144,000? Well, they, they may be made up of Seventh-day Adventists, but the, uh, that's not the, the, the answer. Who are the, the 144,000? They are the church that goes forth conquering and to conquer that carries the message to the world. They're Ephesus. Amen. Okay, so, so at the midnight cry, those, the history of the seven churches, there's another church, and it's the eighth, but it's of the seven. Because it's their, they were, came out of the subject. Well, that and also, but they are the Ephesus church. They're not the Laodicean church. The, the prophetic characteristics takes you back to the beginning of the gospel when the disciples carried the gospel, according to the Bible, to the entire world. They are Ephesus at that level. And that's what Parminder was seeking to destroy. But when you get to the Sunday law, the eighth is of the seven, now is speaking of Revelation 17 and the threefold union of Revelation 17. So I'm just I'm saying we've got to deal with that when we get to the presidents. But the midnight cry is an internal application. The Sunday law is external. Um, a sister commented yesterday, midnight cry, it was 508, Sunday Law 538, Midnight Cry, Pagan Rome, Papal Rome. You got a twin marriage. What I mean by that is that marriage is a twin of the Sabbath. Sister White says they're twin institutions. So at the Midnight Cry, you have twin marriage, Sunday Law, twin Sabbath. We may have got off track way back when on this um, because we were looking for a way mark that fulfilled the midnight cry on a corrupted marriage to be some kind of gay rights law and we kept looking for those kind of things um, some kind of corrupted this movement was looking a few years ago for a fulfillment of a corrupted marriage that would take place in the United States through some kind of legislation or some kind of rulings and there were rulings like that going on at the, that time but I'm saying I'm not seeing any of those rulings line up and they're past tense, there may be future ones. But you don't need that because marriage, 
The symbol of this history is the image of the beast, and the image of the beast is a marriage image. Okay, the image of the beast is the combination of church and state. The first illustration of the combination of church and state is Adam is the state and Eve is the church. Okay, it's a combination of church and state. It's the marriage relationship. So we don't necessarily need to see any external activity of the Congress or the Supreme Court to mark this. All we need to do is to see that first Sunday law and you know then that the Protestants of the United States have assumed enough control over the government of the United States that they're beginning to exercise their authority over the government and that is the, the image of the beast test being underway. Um, and uh, image of the beast test, the United States, world, so, threefold union, midnight cry, you have the government, the Protestants and the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, at the Sunday Law, you got the dragon, beast, and false prophet. There's a threefold union at both places. Um, at the Midnight Cry, you got Raphia for the King of the South. At the Sunday Law, you got Paneum for the King of the South. Um, November 9th, 1989, um, and December 25th, 2021. I have that there because we, we, that's, that's the little caveat that we have to discuss. Um, both the Soviet Union falling, both of those, right? Or the U yeah, the Russia. Soviet Union is typifying the fall of, of Russia. Right. Russia is the head of the Soviet Union. And the fall of the Soviet Union took place from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 2021. Therefore, we're expecting like a two-year period for the fall of Russia, which would be November 9th, 2019, to December 25th, 2021, if you're going to just apply it like that. But there's more to it than that, because what, we were, what I'm trying to show about the, the southern kingdom here is a close relationship to the United States. Okay, a close relationship to the United States. And so, what we see from the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 25th, 1991, is 30 years exactly to December 25th, 2021. What does 30 years make you think of? Well, there's 30 years in there internally, isn't there? From November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019 is 30 years internally for the priests. Jesus is 30 years old when he's going to be baptized. Okay, then he's going to give his testimony for three and a half years, off into probably 2022, if you're going to do it that way. But, is there any other 30 years that you think of in prophecy? I, we've we've there, I've already, I didn't realize this, but I've already showed it to you in your notes. In these parallel columns. The papacy. The papacy what? He has a 30 year, the man of sin has a 30 year preparation. Yeah, from, the, it, it, from 508 to 538. What's happening in 508 is paganism is being, has been taken care of and now there's 30 years of preparation. Okay, so... What I'm saying is there's a close relationship between the King of the South, Russia, and the United States. That's what I've been trying to show by the French Revolution. The beginning of the King of the South is directly connected with the beginning of the United States. 1989 connects them both by constitution. Either the priests or the Levites have to be 30. It, priests, priests have to be 30. Okay. Okay. That, but that, we're, we're where I want to be. We're at the number 30. So I'm saying there is a close relationship between Russia and the United States. And you can show that Russia has a 30-year period marked out from 1991 to 2021 until the papacy takes the throne of the earth. And if you go to the very end of your notes, um, and your notes are a little bit different than me, on page 10 of your notes, You're going to see at the bottom of the page, 1991. Okay, now George Bush the first was doing this in 1990 as well, but I'm selecting 1991 purposely. In 1991, 
uh, before a joint session of Congress. What are you reading? I'm on the bottom of page 10. Yeah, we're there and it's, it's not, not there. there. It's not there. Show us what it looks like. Okay, I must have added this in. I added some things in. That's, so you don't have this. I'm going to read this to you. 1991. This is George Bush, a, a, a snippet of his speech before a joint session of Congress. Senior. Senior. This is his uh, State of the Union address. You know, President every year does a State of the Union address. This is January 29th, 1991. What is at stake is more than one small country. It's a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. The end of the Cold War has been a victory for all humanity. A year and a half ago in Germany, I said that our goal was a Europe whole and free. Tonight, Germany is united. Europe has become whole and free and America's leadership was instrumental. The world can, therefore, seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order where brutality will go unrewarded, uh, brutality will go unrewarded and aggression will meet collective resistant, resistance. George Bush the first addressed before a joint session of Congress on the State of the Union, January 29th, 1991. What I'm saying is, the, the southern king, Russia, has a 30-year period where it, it's going to fall, ultimately, but it falls right at the threefold union. It falls when the papacy's place upon the throne of the earth. And when you go into this history here, in 1991, the State of the Union address that the President of the United States is giving is, we're now entering into a new world order, and that new world order is going to get implemented exactly 30 years later. Okay, maybe not January. Question? Yes. Do you have 1991 Russia that date, the exact date for it? Yes, the Soviet Union collapsed on December 25th, 1991, at which point in time Mikhail Gorbachev stepped down as leader of the Soviet Union and took a job with the United Nations that he still holds. He was moving from the Soviet Union to the United Nations December 25th, 1991, and the Soviet Union was legally and officially scrapped and all that was left was Russia. Gorbachev wrote an article last week that I sent you that, um, that. that was specifically calling for this pandemic to um, help with the new world order moving that forward and it oh, has changed the world order and he wrote a big op-ed that was all over and Gorbachev is still involved in this from the UN. Yes, yeah, I hope everyone heard that. So what I'm saying here is that there was 30 years of preparation to place a papacy on the throne of the earth in 538, from 508, when paganism was removed, until 538. But we're dealing, we're, we're trying to bring to a conclusion, it isn't going to happen, I could see. The, the, the story of the king of the south was what we're dealing with here. We're at the end of it. I'm going to try to get it ended here, so we can go into the other three kingdoms in Daniel 11. There are four kingdoms. The dragon, his story is the king of the south. The beast, his story is Fatima. The false prophet, his story is the constitution. And then the kingdom of the 144,000 that have a, a handful of storylines that are based upon the 144,000's relationship to Christ being the prophet, the priest, and the king. So we have four kingdoms we're looking at in Daniel 11. I'm trying to bring to a dead end the story of the king of the south. And what I want you to see as we begin to trans transcend into the United States, the false prophet, if there's, there's some kind of prophetic relationship. I am not saying that the, the United States is a, the king of the south, but I'm saying that there's somehow, there's a, a, a the, France typifies the United States in so many ways, and that the French Revolution, the beginning of the King of the South in history, is, you mark it with the introduction of their constitution, the rights of man, same year as our constitution, same authors, Lafayette writes the rights of man, he's been, he's been interacting with Thomas Jefferson, who writes the constitution of the United States, there's so many close uh, connections there, 
but ultimately, the king of the south in France becomes the king of the south of Russia with another revolution, the Russian Revolution in, in 1917. And when was the Russian Revolution in 1917? What do they call it in history? Maybe. They call it the October Revolution. The October Revolution. It took place in October of 1917. Okay, so the most important historical, I don't know if most important, but one of the most important dates for the modern King of the South for Russia is October 1917. You understand why I'm saying that? And that revolution is a repetition of the revolution that took place in France because Russia is simply an extension of that King of the South prophetically. But what happened in October of 1917? Oh, the, uh, uh. The miracle of Fatima, October 13th, 1917, which is the most important point in reference for the beast, for the papacy. Okay, so in the same month, in the same year, you have the, the history, the starting history for the king of the south, the, the modern king of the south, Russia, and you have the miracle that gives the point of reference for the beast, the king of the north. Okay, so th th that can't be an accident. There's no way that that, that can be an accident. And we're going to deal a little bit with Fatima because that's the point of reference, the story for the beast. And I, I want you to see the connection there between the story of the dragon, the king of the south, and the story of the beast. They're connected there. But the first king of the south is France, and it's connected to the false prophet with the constitution of 1798. These are the wheels within wheels. You have to become familiar with these to see these connections. These connections are important to acknowledge, to recognize. Um, so, what I'm wanting you to say, well, I'm not trying to confuse anyone. I'm not saying the United States is the king of the South, but they've had this relationship, and here at the end, it's Russia, Putin, the United States, Trump, that are going to be in this struggle, this Third World War from July 18th to December 25th. They're going to have this struggle, but it is not a coincidence or an accident that Russia's given 30 years to lead to the threefold union, and so is the United States. The United States calls, and the President of the United States gives a State of the Union address in 1991 and says, let's do the New World Order. And 30 years later is when the New World Order is going to kick in. So you have both the King of the South, the Dragon Power, and the False Prophet, the United States, a 30-year period where they're preparing to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. And this has been typified by the 30 years that of preparation for the papacy to be placed on the throne of the earth in 538 that began in 508. Right? Also you know? the 30 years for this ministry. The 30 year, yeah, that's another line. The 30 years for this ministry. The, the internal, yeah, that's what I'm saying. We have to become familiar with these characteristics because these externals speak to the internals. Okay, so, um, the, and this is an established understanding at another level. And the 30 years of Christ. Yeah, that's where I was going to go. This is an that established truth at another level. When we do this presentation that we have did for years called the Pattern of Christ, we take Christ and we show that he was born in 4 BC and 30 years later he's baptized. And then he gives his godly testimony for three and a half years and then he's crucified. And underneath that we put 508, 538, the, the line of the Antichrist. 30 years, 30 years. And in 538, the papacy's empowered to give its satanic testimony for three and a half prophetic years until 1798 it receives a deadly wound. So this truth about this 30 years of preparation, we lay the French Revolution over that in that study as well. It's, it's already been in this movement for 20 years. Okay, so now we're, we're seeing why the Lord put it in this movement. This 30 years of preparation, both for the priests and the pagans, okay? Why am I saying the pagans? Because paganism was removed in 508, and it took 30 years to place the papacy on the throne of the earth, and somehow, some way, 
the king of the south, Russia, and the United States are doing the work of those pa of paganism, of removing the resistance to the papacy and doing the work. And we don't really see a whole lot of the papacy because she's hidden. She she's, uh, doesn't play her song until the Sunday law. Then she comes out and commits fornication with all the kings of the earth. The Russia and, and the United States now almost. We're almost in the, in the three and a half years because their 30 years has passed of their line. Their 30 years doesn't pass until December 25th, 2021. 2021 goes back to 1991. Then, the, then they'd be there in their three and a half then? Why, would, why are you saying that? Because there's a three and a half after 30. Okay, but that would be a satanic testimony. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so what satanic testimony begins at the Sunday Law? Modern Rome. And what's modern Rome? It's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And they're going to give a satanic testimony for three and a half years. They come together. They're, it's not, they're not given, the United States isn't given one to the false prophet, and the dragon isn't given another one, and the beast isn't given another. They come together into the threefold union at the Sunday law and have a testimony for one hour. Okay, that's what Revelation 17 says. That's, that one hour is when the eleventh hour workers come in. It's that final hour. Okay, that hour, whatever it represents. Pardon me? Hello? Hello? Um, I was looking into something today, and um, I don't know if it was the war in America or something that ended in 80, um, it's in, it ended in 1865. Um, so the Civil War. Interesting. Yeah. So I found it interesting that um, I added, I think, 126, and I don't know, I was just randomly say with 126. So I added 126, and it also um, led to 1991. And it's kind of like interesting because um, you look at how, I think the war began in 1863, I don't know. No, that was the very Is center of the war. Oh, okay, because I was, I was looking online and it said that the war was, was um, uh, it lasted for, like, it, it took a period of four years or something. Yeah. I don't know. So yep. I found that interesting that it was four years and then from that four years, you can actually add one thing, and it leads to 1999. I don't know. You add, you add, add what? 126. 126. Um, to, to the end of the Civil War, yeah. and it goes to 91. Yeah. I don't know why I was adding 126. I was just playing around with... That's the 1260. I think the primary reason was because the 8th, and I was like, oh, okay, so from 1960 years, then let's just play around with it. Interesting, now to just added in because you're speaking about um, how 2001 goes back to 1991. So I was just adding in that. No, I'm not saying to, I'm not saying 2001 goes back to 1991. I'm saying 2021 goes back to 91. Thanks. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Well, um, it, it may not. It may not be a denial of what you found. But there may be because two thousand one yeah. is a waymark, but we're talking about thirty years from ninety one to twenty twenty one. Or okay. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I didn't get into the notes the, where it says. Um, you want me to finish the column, all right? Uh, where it, on page two of your your notes, not the, not the column. I'll go back to the column, where it says ruling power Amerigo Vespucci. Mm -hmm. well, that's where we'll start next time, all right? But now back to page one. Let's go. We'll walk through the columns. Um, First Ottoman and Egyptian War. Midnight Cry, why do I say that? And then in the Sunday Law, Second Ottoman and Egyptian War. 
because when it comes to Russia... Can we get these notes on the chat? We put them all on the WhatsApp chat. They're all in the WhatsApp groups for all the notes. Every one of them. I'm sorry, I can't hear it. They're all in the WhatsApp chat. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, why do I say first Ottoman and Egyptian war and midnight cry? You have the king of the south, king of the north, battling both of those. Okay, because when it comes to the king of the south, Russia, we have, in the witness about the prophetic role of Russia, we have three proxy wars that we can point to. We can point to one um, from 1979 to 1989 in Afghanistan, a proxy war between the United States and Russia that was carried out in an Islamic country. And then we point to a current one that's going on in Syria, began in 2011, then in, then in theory is going to end in 2021. But then we go back into Millerite history, and in Millerite history, there was a similar proxy war, with the exception, with the exception that it has a, a, a war at the beginning and a war at the end, and it has a period of time in the middle when there isn't anything. Okay, but nevertheless, if you go back to Millerite history, the first... Um, Ottoman and Egyptian war, Egypt's the king of the south, and the Ottomans are the king of the north, and Egypt prevailed. The king of the south wins that war. But then, whatever, how many years later it was, um, 19, 1839 is where it starts up, the second Ottoman war. At, in that one, the king of the north, the Ottomans, defeat the south. So that's like Rafi and Paniam? Like yes, that's like Rafi and Paniam. Um, it's, it's a parallel to Rafi and Paniam. It's a parallel to 1798 when the King of the South prevails, and 1989 then the King of the North prevails. But also, what I want you to see, the reason I have this in here, the First Ottoman-Egyptian War, the difference, if, if someone wants to be a skeptic, what they'll say, I'll, I'll show you their skepticism, we have Afghanistan, 79 to 89. That's 89. And then we have what began in 2011, and we're saying it's going to go to 2021 in Syria. And I'm saying that in Millerite history, from 1831 to 33, I believe, maybe 34, you have this first Ottoman-Egyptian war. And then from... I'll put 38, but it might be 39 to 41, you have the second. So the skeptic's going to say, well, look, it, he has two 10-year periods here. And he's saying that this proxy war here is the same. And I'm saying it is the same because it has the prophetic characteristics that speak to Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40 is emphasizing that first the king of the south wins, and then the king of the north wins. Okay, and you have that in Daniel 11, verse 40 on two witnesses. You have it in 1798 to 1989, the first witness, and then you have it to Rafi and Paniam. Okay, but here's my point. Here's what I want you to see. This break in the 10 years that some people may stumble over, that's in verse 40. Because here you have 1798, 1989, and then there's a break until Raphia and Paneum. So the idea that the break makes void this application of a proxy war, this break fits the structure of verse 40. It's, it's, it's sound. It's airtight. Um, so th then, in these parallel columns, we've got the sixth hour and the ninth hour. That's Mark 15.33. That's Christ on the cross. Um, and it's the first attack in Japan on August 6th. And the second Japanese attack on August 9th. 6th and 9th of August. Nuclear attack, nuclear attack. Now, what I want you to remember is, and this is what you've got to remember on these two columns, once we have these two columns of the Midnight Cry and the Sunday Law, then we switch them over. And the first waymark becomes the Sunday Law, and the second 
Waymark becomes the universal Sunday law. Because this history here is the image of the beast time period in the United States, and it is illustrating the image of the beast time period in the world. That's why the midnight cry is repeated. So I'm just giving you two columns, but what you do with these two columns is you just flip them over to the next history, okay? Because the next history begins with that nuclear attack on December 25th. And it, it begins there, but it ends with the nuclear attack at the close of probation. What happens, what nuclear attack happens at the close of probation? The ten kings are going to burn Rome with fire and they're going to stand far off because they don't want to get close to the fallout. Okay, so I, you, I'm just telling you, the, this structure just, it gets repeated. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's a doubling. Okay, so here's where we were leading to, the reason I had these columns, during with, do, dealing with the French Revolution. You see 1789 is the midnight cry, and 1798-99 is the Sunday Law. That's the 10-year period of the French Revolution. But also in the French Revolution, you have July 27, 1793. That's the midnight cry, and July 27, 1794 is the Sunday Law. This is the, the real the real heart of the reign of terror. This is the one-year bloodbath. Begins in the year the king loses his head and Robespierre becomes a dictator. And at the end of the year, Robespierre is executed and there's a new dictator that comes on the scene of history. All right? Napoleon. So it's dictator, dictator. It's execution, execution. It's a bloodbath for one year. And then you have 1793, which is still the French Revolution, and this is, this is the beginning of the bloodbath where the king gets executed, but it goes to 1796. This is the history that Sister White points to, at least in furs. And this is also the three and a half years of Revelation 11. And what it is, is that there's a war carried out in this history against the Vendi in western France. And the Vendi are pro-Catholics. And this, this, the revolution is against two things. It's against the kings, the monarchy, and the papacy. So when they begin the revolution, revolution they want to deal with the, the royalty, they want to deal with the Catholics. And in western France, there's a, a stronghold of Catholicism in the Vendi area. And this war goes on from 1793 to 1796. And this is the time period of the three and a half years in Revelation 11. And this is the time period that Sister White will speak to. Okay, um, she, she refers that in 1796, uh, they reversed their decision on doing away with, with religion. Yes. I hate to do this when we're close to the end. We're already way past our time. But... You can see where, when we said that there's a chance that Trump could be die, where he could also very easily, because he's becoming a dictatorship, he could actually become um, killed. Yeah, there's lots of witnesses to that, and, and the way we've addressed that, we've seen that Trump, that there's there's typifications of Trump that show him being killed. Number one, Abraham Lincoln, first Republican. World War II, Roosevelt dies before World War II is over. And I'm saying that from the Midnight Cry to Sunday Law, that's World War III. But the way that we've addressed that is that he's a king. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, Thou, O king, are the head of gold. So a king represents a kingdom. A king can represent the king himself at a specific level, but he can represent the kingdom. So we've identified on lots of witnesses that at the Sunday Law, the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, the United States, dies. It's executed. Okay, It's sacrificed, actually. You can even put it into a sacrificial system um, illustration. So we've said, well, this is, it could be Trump physically or it can just be speaking to the death of the United States because he is the king that represents him. But, uh, but Pence is pretty provocative. <laughs> From 1793 to 1796 is the Vendee Wars? Yes. How do you spell it? V-E-N-D-E-E. -E. Okay. And then I'll cl close with this. Two systems removed 
and two systems established. Okay, and I don't know how, I, and I struggled with how to express this. But in 1789, um, feudalism, slavery, was removed. Okay, that's a system, if that's the right way to call it. But also the monarchy is removed. The king loses his head. So you have the, the government that was a maniacal, was a, a government ruled by a king, okay? <laughs> It's taken out in 1789, and the feudal system that has been all over Europe for, for I don't know for how long, it's removed. So you got two systems removed at the midnight cry, and I'm saying you will have two systems removed at the midnight cry in our history, and then you have two systems established um, at the Sunday Law, and we'll deal with that later. Um, so let's bring this to a close, close and Tomorrow, not tomorrow, in the next presentation, we'll begin with Amerigo Vespucci. Is that on Sabbath? Are you speaking yeah. on Sabbath? Yeah. So this will, tell them it'll be on Sabbath. The next yeah, this will be on Sabbath. When we take up the, the presidents, and the eighth is of the seven. And we, I still have some summarization to do of the King of the South that isn't in these notes, but... Any final questions, comments, or observations? All right, Lord willing, we'll see you Thank all. You. We'll, we'll see you on Sabbath, Lord willing. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are making the wheels within the wheels clear, that you're tying these things together in a very concise and secure fashion for us to see. Um, it's unfortunate that we were not studying as we should for the past couple years where these things were already recognized. Uh, forgive us for that, but we thank you for the light that you're opening up. We ask a blessing upon our day's activities, a blessing upon the work of um, transmitting this message around planet Earth. Um, please continue uh, to guide and direct this ministry as you have done for so long. In Jesus' name, amen.